Uh, is it Mueller? Or... Yeah, I'm recording. Oh, hey, oh, you are. Are, you, are you also like letting people in the waiting room? Yep, I will be in charge of that. Balkan Circle. My name is Mary Newberger, and I am the Professor of History here at UT Austin and also the Director of the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies. And Kirill Avramov is my co-host. And we are in the same room today. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mary. My name is Kirill Avramov. For those of you that uh, will meet me for the first time, I'm an Assistant Professor of Political Science at the Department of Slavic uh, and Eurasian Studies here at UT Austin, where the weather is really nice. And uh, we are inside because we are having a very um, exciting lecture and a very uh, dear uh, guest to us. Uh, and this is Professor Sonia Tamar Seaman, uh, who is an associate professor of ethnomusicology in the Butler School of Music's Musicology and Ethnomusicology Division. And she holds active affiliations with the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, the Center for Women and Gender Studies, and Greece, our own. Uh, center. She serves as a BSOM's uh, Bachelor of Arts Program Coordinator and um, something that's really close to my heart, the UT's Fulbright uh, Program Advisor and Chair. Her work demonstrates uh, her ongoing commitment to diversity, serving uh, on UT's Fine Arts Diversity Committee, uh, the Council for Racial and Ethnic Unity and Diversity, uh, and she's teaching courses on music and social identities, such as music and gender, uh, identity and Difference, Music and Culture, Romani Music and Representation, and the Music of the Middle East. She specializes in music of the Middle East and Southeastern Europe and has been working with Romani professional musicians uh, since the mid-80s. She's the founder and director of UT's uh, Middle Eastern Ensemble, which is called Bereket, uh, which uh, brings together students, faculty, staff, and community members in studying and performing regional, court, religious, and pop music from these regions and their diasporic communities. Uh, today, uh, we have the pleasure to, uh, to, to, to have this esteemed guest uh, with her topic, Post-Colonialist Perspectives on Roman uh, Racializations in Ottoman Turkey and Macedonia. Sonia, please take it away. <laughs> thank you. And big thanks to Chris and the Balkan Circle, to Mary, to Kiro, um, and also uh, for everything you guys are doing for this amazing vital, this is going to be a talk through. So I'm going to ask for your thoughts to think alongside. And I'm also very sorry, the bottom part of this has cut off because at the bottom, I say with gratitude <laughs> to Professor Chelsea Ohuri and Professor Ionida Costache. So that actually is right under the green Yeah, actually on the Zoom, you can see it. Oh, so much good. Allah. I think All it's right, just good. on our production. Good. Yeah. So um, just to say that this came from an ACES panel together with uh, Professors Ohuri and Kostache, mm -hmm. where we thought collectively together and separately about the issue of race in Southeastern Europe and for which I was providing the Ottoman piece. And that's also where I'm coming back to all y'all for some help in um, how we can look at this. Um, I have some images here that come from the Ottoman Empire, but it's not just relegated to Turkey. For example, Enbuk Kibariye that came out of contemporary Turkey, maybe way back in the early 1990s, but um, Kibaria was very popular among the Romani musicians I worked with in Macedonia. So we know that these ideas and self-presentations continue to permeate each other across borders. So I'm going to frame this. Um, and I just want to mention this is part of an article in progress. So the more you guys give me feedback, wonderful. I'd be deeply appreciative. Um, so here is the... Um, Mm, uh, yeah, good, that came up more clearly. The questions that I would like to frame this with, because we're going to get into some weeds with the Ottoman Turkish racialized, the racializations component. But I'm thinking this aloud because I've, in part, I have not found a comfortable home, right? I go to um, the Middle Eastern Studies Conference and I'm in a panel of people who are 
the, the idea about race has to do with slavery and people from Africa, right? Not internal racializations and colonizations. And I go to ACES, and fortunately, there's a very vibrant conversation from critical racial studies. And again, uh, thanks to Chelsea and Ionida, we were thinking these things through together, and many thanks to Chelsea for her ongoing brilliant work. Um, but then I, I look at the literature on Roma in Southeastern Europe, and I notice that the issues are turning, the, the way that race is being interpreted is coming up through ethno-national formulations in Southeastern Europe and whiteness vis-a-vis -vis Europe, which is great, but there's double erasures going on. One, where are the Roma in this? And, and fortunately, there's a body of really excellent scholars looking at that issue. But when they look at the racialization of Roma towards whitening, they participate in the ongoing legacy of erasing the impact of the Ottoman Empire. So this is what I wanted to add back to the mixture. So great quote from Vinci here um, about subject positions for the Roma and the racializations of Roma. But I would say that this project of or interrogation remains incomplete if we don't also interrogate the ongoing Orientalisms and Ottomanisms that continue to exist in former Ottoman territories, which was a result of their ethno-national formulation was to react against the Ottoman Empire while they still have Muslim citizens and they still have very large and important communities of Roma upon which they're relying on labor to be exploited. So this affects multiple levels of erasure. And I'm doing this uh, through cultural production. My argument is that often through um, ideological formulations, have their most potent force through cultural production because that then escapes discussions in parliaments and in elections, but it reminds people, it reposits, represents fixed ideas about who other people are, what they are, what they're worthy of. So this is my big, big picture. So um, I'm noticing the ways that recent studies on Roma in Southeastern Europe participate and perpetuate double erasures and that it the excavation process and we as academics love to excavate, but it has a political urgency because without that, we're missing how Ottoman legacies continue to operate. And I'll just make one tiny observation uh, since one of the other fields that I'm in investigating is labor, music as laboring activity. Mm -hmm. And what I have noticed, which is um, true of Roma musicians in Southeastern Europe, as well as in former uh, Turkey, Turkey, is that they operate according to an Ottoman guild system. Ooh. And that has continued. And in fact, it continues because it's not available to government sanctions. It's in the families, but it operates very much like Ottoman guilds operated, except for within the families. And it probably predated Ottoman guild structures. So here's one small example of we've got ongoing Ottomanisms and those contribute to certain kinds of exploitation and power structures. So there is that background. So I'm going to launch into some of this as a, a superficial way. Um, it, I know that uh, it's hard for me to see the um, the chat, but stop me anytime um, and, and or say something if you'd like to go further. And I'm just going to lay this out, basically. So here's some examples of... Roma presentations that are founded upon racializations that were in part informed by Western European colonial forms 
of race and racial ideas. So just a little bit of sound, because this is about sound. So note, note the characterization of the dark girl. Okay, so if you don't come, my dear angel, um, you are going to be the wound. She is the wound. And this is part of a tradition of theatrical songs, of which there still are in Southeastern Europe, these songs that were um, part of a circuit of traveling theaters. And in these, in between the acts, there would be these performances of theatrical songs, which were caricatures of different kinds of people in the Ottoman Empire. Many of those songs have continued to be popular. Another one is Osman, Osmanaga, Osmanaga, you're such a fine painter, paint me with your brush, et cetera, et cetera. So what they do is they present social types mm -hmm. on a stage. And they also, in them, they have um, performative statements of being right? So some of them are, she is this kind of girl, and others are, I'm this kind of girl, right? Mm -hmm. And this is one way in which ideas about Roma have been continued. Those songs remain very popular. Um, so uh, that's, oops, sorry. <laughs> she wants to be heard again. Okay. So we see these discourses about dark, right? So phenotypes. Um, we see this in Turkey. This has become a, a, a they call kibar, a polite way of referring to Roma. They are our dark citizens. Right? Um, and you can see many of these definitions um, that are circulating and popular. It's sort of the Wikipedia approach to dictionaries mm -hmm. where people put in. And you see them in official statements, right? Uh, president of the Edune Roma Education Program. Um, who notes that this is actually exclusionary. It says you're a citizen, but you're... Othering. Uh, othering, yeah, dark, right. Um, so what I also have noticed is that uh, many news um, report, journalist reports, but also speeches by political fitch, um, uh, officials utilize this as if it's a good thing, right? Um, we shouldn't see Roma as second-class citizens. You know, it doesn't matter that their skin is dark, we, no, blah, blah, blah. What matters is the color of our heart. So they also move into this realm of not only just being dark and phenotype, but they provide color, right? So we can see a lot of this also in how African-Americans are viewed or Latinx communities are viewed through their cultural production. They are the, right? That's one way that whiteness disappears. Right? But it puts the labor on Roma to produce and reproduce those, quote, colors. Um, so in this, there's a couple of layers in here. I hypothesized, um, or I put forth, that whiteness exists through ex-nomination. This follows Barth's, the idea of um, that which stays in power is able to do so because it's not named and the other things are named. Mm -hmm. Bourdieu also did this in terms of gender, masculinity being not named, but, you know, we have, now we have to say, you know, chairwoman, right? Instead of chair, <laughs> you know, instead of chair, right? There's an issue. Oh, chairman, we can't just say chairman anymore, right? So we know that this is a technique by which dominant groups continue to maintain power because they're not named. They're the norm, they disappear, right? So that comes from uh, Bourdieu, both Bourdieu and Barth. And what I'm noting is that the process of Ottoman colonialism, and this is how my project participates in this discourse, uh, evolving uh, examination um, of post-colonial critique vis-a-vis -vis the Ottoman Empire, right? That Ottoman colonialism was a particular kind of formation, right? Roman imperial incorporation, not only just using the roads and the aqueducts, but also using these forms of incorporation and Arabic, pre-existing Arabic stratification systems by dividing up communities mm -hmm. into what they call millet, 
semi-autonomous subgroups identified either by language or by religion. But, and that worked throughout the Ottoman Empire, more or less, or bumps. But in the 19th century, with the Ottoman polity or Ottoman political leaders looking to looking for ways to reform its system and drawing on Western European models, they saw part of their task is civilizing the entering in this conversation about civilization, which is pretty ironic considering the many aspects of the Ottoman Empire, which compared to Europe at the same time were quite, I mean, we know civilized, right, is a particular kind of category that takes as its apex, at its apex, Western European society and mm -hmm. social practices, cultural practices, right? So these Ottoman reforms drew on these Western European ideas of civilization within their practice of ongoing colonialism, right? So it wasn't that there's a polity imposed from outside, but they were the polity. And they merged Ottoman social schema with Western European notions of race as inherently biological and made that slippage following Western European of mapping biology into cultural civilization schema. Right? Mm -hmm. So, and the, the richest figure for Ottoman policymakers were Roma and the intellectuals used Roma as this test case of civilizability, civilization mm -hmm. ability. Um, so there are, as I was looking through these 19th century sources, descriptions of Chingene, uh, the gypsy Roma, as a creature, Mahluka, right? So uh, kind of like Frankenstein, you could think about the Frankenstein story as part of this Western European grappling with what is and who can be civilized. Um, and that these were also imposed via gender, that Roma men, or they called Chingene men, were viewed as eminently more possible than Chingene women. So we also see gender stratification within this. And the um, these were displayed through story, literature, fiction, songs, um, theatrical productions, visual representations, and um, those forms were adopted into canon formation practices of the Turkish Republic, mm -hmm. founded in 1923. So as much as Turkey was founded in 1923, attempted to distance themselves from Ottoman, we are no longer Ottoman, we are Turkey, we are Turks, we are not multicultural, we are ethno-national, what are you going to do with those groups that were necessary for defining Ottoman civilization when now we want to be Turkish civilization. And so the Roma continued to be that category. And in particular, whiteness, the striving towards Turkish whiteness um, included the goals of securing ethno-national identity and modernity. Mm -hmm. But I, as I as I look at this, that was actually made possible by othering, and particularly Roma, drawing on these form each, uh, formulations. Um, so that's the overall thing. Um, here's some background information that may be very uh, schematic for many of you. I'm sure you know all of this. Um, and one of the factors that's very interesting in all of this is there are multiple types of Roma within the Anatolia Peninsula. So that's pretty rare um, throughout Southeastern Europe, for example. So there are these populations of Dom, which are designated as a Middle Eastern Rome that are thought to have emerged first from the polity or from the area of Afghanistan, um, Northwestern India, um, uh, for which they still have three genders. They have a neuter, uh, a neuter gen, uh, designation, which doesn't exist in the other two languages. Um, and uh, that's thanks to Ian Hancock, who pointed that out. Um, and then 
uh, Roma, which are the name itself, it's hypothesized because of Rome, right? These were the groups that were predominantly found throughout the former Byzantine territories, therefore called Rome, called themselves Rome. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other group, Lom, which also have other names that are Armenian, close to Armenian, most of them are Christian, and they speak a, lang a, a language of whatever we're going to call it, Loma Vren, which has a lot of Armenian words in it. So uh, here we have a situation in Turkey where about 75, 80, 85% of professional musical services are provided by Rome. So their influence is outsized compared to their actual numbers. Much like, again, we could look at the role of Black communities in the US in music and other cultural practices. And that's directly the result of a couple factors. Uh, for Rome, it is part of exclusion, but it's also part of one of the trades that many Roma families have been engaged in for centuries. Um, so uh, other factors from this is that the, um, a, the Ottoman Empire in particular, especially in the 19th century, began to focus on what was happening on its borders. And Roma and other groups um, were very important for administrators to consider how are we going to tax them? Mm -hmm. How are we going to control them? Who are they? Right? Uh, Ottoman administration was amazing about documenting and statistics and numbering. And of course, this is part of extracting resources. Um, and so Roma, Roma communities and uh, and related groups, Romani, Dom, Lomavren, were, or Lomari, were designated as internal others. It, it um, This issue comes up repeatedly. We look at tax documents. They should have been cut a break because they were Muslim, but they were taxed as if they were not Muslim. Mm -hmm. Right, et cetera, et cetera. So that was a matter of maintaining them near the margins to be able to benefit from their labor. Um, so this exploration that I'm involved in also um, draws a lot on recent movements among Ottoman historians for uh, incorporating post-colonialism. You know, Ottoman Empire does not lend itself right away to post-colonial critique, right? It was the colonizing force. And we know that Southeastern Europe, they're viewed as the, um, you know, the, the reason for whatever, anything bad that had happened. Um, but fortunately, there are um, several with Senim Geringi, Usama Makdisi, Faika Celik, who have been delving into this. How can we understand how colonization worked? How do they colonize their internal communities? Right? Um, and so Deringil points to um, the external border territories, particularly the um, Amazigh communities and how Ottoman administrators tried to deal with them. Um, and then Makdisi was looking at uh, Lebanese border areas, Bedouin, how were those viewed? And they, uh, both of those scholars note the, the um, uh, concern and labeling of those problematic people as wild, right? Mm -hmm. So here we've got the civilization thing going on. Um, and Faika Chilik has looked at the differential treatment um, regarding civilizing and educating Roma. And what I'm pushing into this is how do we put this together with gender as part of this understanding of how racializations in general was working in the 19th century. And noting that the overall goal on the part of these administrators was to prove Ottoman Turks belong alongside the pinnacle of European civilized people, right? Um, and then now, then it goes back to what do we do about our Roma? Here they are playing music for us and they're cleaning the bathhouses and they're doing this and we see them everywhere. 
and they're not on the borders. They're right next door. They're in another neighboring mm -hmm. mahale, and uh, we are intertwined. Our economies, our subsistence, our um, cultural practice are very much intertwined with these people who are not really us, but kind of should be us, right? So um, we see this issue of us, not us, belonging, not belonging, in a number of different ways, going back to the 17th century, uh, I'm sure even earlier, but I wanted to pull these out because one is from an Armenian perspective and one is from a Turkish Muslim, Muslim, Muslim perspective, Evliya Kermujian, who um, much like uh, uh, Chelebi in yeah, that Chelebi. period, right? You know, wandered around the various neighborhoods of Istanbul and described, we get an Armenian take on what he saw as opposed to the mostly Muslim uh, perspective from uh, Evliya Chelebi. Um, but I, I found this very interesting. When we, Armenians, mm -hmm. them, argue with the Greeks, we respond by saying our poshas, which is also the name for the lom, a mm -hmm. self-name, um, earn their bread by the sweat of their brow. However, your Greek Roma make their trade and pleasure with drums and their hands wander around taverns and inciting youth, youth with racy songs like give a peach, come to my bosom. And then they <laughs> belly dance in front of them. Okay, so it's this idea of our. So one of the other complicating factors is the way various communities within the Ottoman Empire, and I will say even today, will view some Romas, oh, well, they're like us. Mm -hmm. They're ours. They're not like those other Roma. And I have heard this even recently, right? Oh, you know, of course, you know, our... Our uh, our mothers were sutane, you know, they we breastfed together with this family. You could, you know, you could sit down in their room and it would even be clean, right? Mm -hmm. This idea of proximity, which is again an indication, right? You wouldn't say that of somebody you just felt comfortable with, right? So that these uh, senses of um, familiarity also cross-cut into ethnic, linguistic, religious belonging. Um, and, you know, here's the other quote from uh, Evliya Chelebi. You couldn't cross into that Roma Mahale because of all the noise and the wailing, right? So the portrayal of these communities as being extremely out of control, wild, wow. not civilized, loud, et cetera, et cetera. And they also took place in uh, physical presentations or descriptions, some cheerful trees that have taken the form of human beings. So you see many, many comments in 19th century writing and early 20th century writing about how the Roma are likened to nature, right? So they're not mm -hmm. quite human yet. And uh, this one um, from uh, Mitat's novel, if you bring a good Arabian horse and our scoundrel, the donkey, side by side, you'll see the difference between them as clear as the difference between a gypsy and a non-gypsy, right? So mapping it into the animal world as well. And then civilization, as well as saying they're all the same, right? Remember I said earlier, there are multiple, and I only mentioned three different large groups, but when it gets down to occupational groups, and you know, there are groups that don't even recognize itself, they're each other as being similar, right? Compared to Mithat saying, wherever gypsies have been seen, they all have the same shape and form, right? Et cetera, et cetera. And then mapping them onto what they call Zenjilaj, which is that negative term used for people from of African descent, right? Mm -hmm. Negroes, right? Um, so these then, through the European discussions about race, opened the door to map older hierarchies into this new phenotypical racialized hierarchy and to discuss those biological categories in relation to cultural and social civilization. So there's a lot to untangle there. And one of the other points I would just mention is that it's important that Ibn Khaldun, uh, the writings of Ibn Khaldun and um, were very, were also 
kept within the mix. I mean, those were recited, recycled since the 14th, 15th century. So now they're being recycled here, mm -hmm. but then moved into this realm of European racialized categories. And then this comes out in novels, uh, particularly in relation to music, um, and also played out in terms of gender, right? And age, right? Chingane men were never as disgraceful and as shameless as their women, right? So gendering. So in terms of the civilizational scale, Roma men had more potential to be saved, women, but not. Um, and then, but yet there's more writing about Roma women. We can talk about that. Exotification and sexualization and the purposes of that, which then kept Roma in general in that category of there's no hope for them. Um, oh. Yeah. I'm, I'm just I'm just reading. Sorry, you know yeah. how some of the quotes are amazing. <laughs> They're amazing. It really are. Yeah, um, yeah. And the story, the storylines, I and mean, that would be a whole other topic. The stories are often very Pygmalion esque, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? A Ottoman Turk takes in this Roma woman, and it ends up being his downfall, basically, because you can't escape the taint. And there's a lot of those, many of those kinds of novels and stories. Um, yeah. And even the trades um, that the skills that they had were viewed as something that were biological. So check this out. Um, the aunt of this figure in this novel uh, teaches this Roma woman and says, oh, that pert young baggage is rather shrewd. <laughs> Whatever you show her, she immediately takes it in. So she's not capable of generating herself. She's mm -hmm. just a good mimic, right? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, she can learn violin. After all, she's a chingene. So whatever skills they have are viewed back, subsumed back into something biological, right? Um, yeah. I want to keep mindful of the time. Um, there's another example. I mentioned the um, figures of Roma, and Roma women and Roma men and how those were portrayed through the pop songs of the time, which were these canto songs. These canto songs were very, very uh, really important to understand because they were disseminated in towns. They, there were traveling theatrical troops that went through Southeastern Europe, right? And brought these, the newest play and, oh, you know, check out this hot song. And the songs were sold in these very cheap chapbooks, right? Not with notation. Well, some were with notation, but with words. So you could see it, it was Tin Pan Alley of the 19th century. And many of these songs, as I said, have continued to be used as a basis for contemporary ideas and repertoires. Um, and in them, what's unique is this self-naming, um, which is different than the, the older Ottoman traditions where there is a generalized presentation of affect in the poem without an I. Mm -hmm. But here we have I's and we's. But the writers are not Roma and the performers are not Roma. Right? This is gypsy face. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it tells you everything you need to know about these Roma. Right, she dances bravely, and then she says, "I'll take tiny mincing steps." And the Armenian or Greek or Jewish woman, who is the canto singer, comes out dressed in a particular way to suggest oh. being Roma and does those movements. Right, so there's it, it's a didactic uh, way. Um, this comes from this idea of the um, panorama. Oh shoot, who was the author of that? I'm embarrassed, but this panoramic cultural portrayal of society as a way to make differences legible. Mm -hmm. And this seems to be a feature, particularly in modernity. Um, Accenting on the different pieces. Yeah, but like, what are, okay, how do we read this? Oh, we got a mishmagosh here, you know, who are we gonna, who's this and who's that? Well, they're an Armenian and they do this and they're a Roma and they do that, or they're a gypsy. So in this, these are very important resources for understanding the ways in which ideologies about Roma 
in these settings was disseminated. And again, I, I say that they're very trenchant. And so the, the dancer who'd be doing the chief the tenny dance would be saying, I'll take mincing steps, would dress like this, right? Very short skirt. They were known for having pink stockings or they would dress, it's an interesting thing. They would either do this, which is they're just kind of like a sexy babe thing, or they would do this Roma-ish, gypsy face thing, right? Neither of these two are Roma, uh -huh. but she's wearing chalvage, right? Uh -huh. And she's got the long braids and he's got a tambourine, right? So the accoutrements of um, posing Roma. Um, yeah. So the other part of this is I'm, I'm arguing that many of these have continued. They were incorporated into the formation of Turkey as an ethno-national mono, quote, mono ethno-national nation state. Um, yet, uh, despite the claims of singularity of all of our citizens are Turks, they continued administrators, politicians, continue to work with this idea of Roma being on the margins. And in fact, what I noted through musical practices is that the othering of Armenians, Greeks, and Jews was increasingly foisted onto Roma, including I found quotes from um, a very famous music theorist um, about, a, it was an opinion piece in a music um, dergi about, um, well, you know, it's it's the corruption that was brought in by these non, non-Muslim non to our music, right? Mm -hmm. our, right, our music. And it is perpetuated by those Roma musicians who teach them. So not, it's, there. there's hierarchies of pollution. So uh, Greeks, Armenians, Jews are, in a sense, polluting the purity of this idea of a Turkish Ottoman that, of course, we can <laughs> debate that one, right? We know that that's an ideological hold in the 20th century, but increasingly over time, more and more of those critiques would be placed on Roma, and Roma would be blamed for maintaining those polluting trends. Um, so, uh, yeah, and we see this discussion of civilization, of civilizability throughout the 20th century in relation to Roma musicians, as I mentioned, who play, provide the majority of musical professional services, right? So um, here are just some examples of this. All kinds of foreign sounds come out, right? Most, the other people are people who unfortunately learned from the chingene and were trained in the most inferior taverns, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is just by way of showing how this idea of civilization, civilizability continued through Turkey as part of establishing a, a white Turkey. Um, and uh, many other examples, 1941, the establishment of the radio ensembles, professional ensembles, where we have uh, Ismail Dede as a composer, right, from uh, the 17th century, putting next to Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. So it's like we have our right canon formation mm -hmm. was also occurring, which was another uh, a field where it was important in order to uh, right, sorry, 18th century important to exclude Roma, who were the very people who were maintaining these traditions. Um, yeah, and many other examples. Um, uh, I'll just mention one important feature is Roma are particularly valued for their ability to improvise. And there's a Romani word they use for kiddies or kiddies G is a person who can do it really well. And it, that ability has been used to create new musical genres and use it benefited the recording industry. And it is also by which they are damned for their ability to improvise. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, those were, and in general, there are sonic aspersions cast upon Roma. Remember that quote from uh, Evliya Chelebi, can't yeah. go through that neighborhood for all the wailing, right? <laughs> Um, so 
the um, idea of they're noisy, they're vulgar, um, women come through and they make a lot of noise in our, our neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, so that's what the, um, sorry. This is an example of kitties. It's okay. improvised by a little clarinetist for people to dance to. It's all improvisation. Figures. And then with the formation of the nation state and cultural management of the ensembles to create national folk music, and y'all know this from what happened in Southeastern Europe, um, tunes were taken from Roma communities, sanitized, public, you know, printed through the archives, taught by teachers, so um, students never hear the originals. Um, and so one graphic example is a tune from this Thracian area that circulated among Roma and, and non-Roma. This is what the radio did to it in 1944. Balawas do not play in that area. Spoons do not play in that area. Mixed choirs, never. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And this is a Roma band playing an instrumental version of it, a Roma band from this very town. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, there's a lot of stuff in here. Oh, go right, go right. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. All right. So we're going to move on. Um, so overall, this is the um, central claim here that the melding of visual, sonic, embodied racialization schema were necessary to secure a white European, Europeanized Turkish identity. And this was done by virtue of hyper nominating, hyper amplifying Turkish Roman visual sounds and movements to create dark or color, right? And that which is not marked then can disappear via ex nomination into unquestioned whiteness. Mm -hmm. um, so there we are. Um, this is about craftsmanship, which that's a whole another thing I'm working on. And here's an example. Here's a song that was set to a, a regional song by the Roma singer Kibaria, who took that I am dark, right? You know, we remember we have that in the cantos, right? Mm -hmm. But it is also um, celebrated by Roma and then also problematic. Because in the same people that would say to me, of course, she's gorgeous. Oh, yeah, we are dark. We are beautiful. Oh, my God, don't be in the sun too. Oh, God, you look so dark. Yeah, don't, don't wear that color, right? <laughs> so because they're dealing with the external perceptions of who they are. So that's the... Can we, can we hear it? Is there a... <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, that was the <laughs> And an instrument associated with Roma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. For this opportunity, gosh, yeah, I really I enjoyed it, uh, and it was um, such a lively presentation. You know, Mary, you can see that there are a lot of you. things in the chat which I, I cannot see, but I saw things are <laughs> popping, so probably Yay. the audience would have. All right.
right. uh, some questions. Great. Well, I think both Catalina and Christian had some sort of questions or conversation. Awesome. I don't, I don't know if either of you, well, maybe stop. Yeah, there you go. Thank um, you. If either of you want to, Christian, do you want to just ask your question? Where'd you go? Oh, there it is. Uh, how to say, uh, probably um, I, I wasn't able to hear everything because there is also, I mean, some internet troubles here in Bulgaria, but uh, it was very, very interesting. It's, it's not quite, uh, it, it's not quite appropriate how to say topic because uh, how to say probably historiography here in the Balkans, we don't like to be criticized or, or to, to, criticize, to, to, to criticize ourselves. So, uh, but it was very interesting and new for me. I just uh, have to say, uh, want, want to add that there is some kind of uh, Ottoman laws, I mean, legislative, uh, legislative norms. Uh, according to them, the, the Roma was inappropriate uh, to be taken into the unitary corpus because of the, how to say, uh, strange reason to, to not be... Uh, to preserve the blood of the Ujak, I mean, the unnecessary corps of spoiling or, or something like that. So uh, just as comment and uh, some, some fact to support your, your thesis. It was very, very interesting and congratulations, congratulations. Oh yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, I will say, um, that official ruling is not actually how things worked in practice. So, for example, Roma were frequently used as foot soldiers. We know that they were brought into the army. They, um, there was a community of Roma who were used to breach the walls at Tokapo and, and Sulukule, for which they received a large land grant. Um, and there, there's documentation about this. And we know that who played in the Yeni Cheri's Mehter ensembles, right? Yeah, yeah, large, yeah. Right? yeah. So it's actually a little more complicated than it seems. Um, but I, you're, you're right. Without question. Without question. Uh, yeah. He occupied this um, very exploited category where they were used wherever it was useful. And then there would be these occasional laws, like there was a law in, was it the 18th century? Roma are no longer allowed to ride on a horse. It's like, okay, <laughs> what the heck happened that led to that very silly law? But um, so I think there's a lot of unpacking, unpacking there, but that's great. I would love to see some information uh, from the, about the Yeni Chiri's official ban and here's another thing to consider. If they're talking about bloodline in the Ojak, that suggests to me Bekpashi, um, because the Yeni Cheri, many of them were drawn from and or supported and or ended up being members of the Bektashi yeah, community. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I wonder if this was maybe more the Ojaks from the side of the Bektashi. There's just a lot to untangle there that I'm really curious about. Um, I'd be delighted if you would share that information with me. Yeah, definitely. We will exchange our contact, and I will send you some some documentary issues regarding that topic. Yes, Thank you. Thank you. Well, Christian, this is the okay. beauty of the circle. You know that uh, people yeah. actually can have um, you know professional contacts and um, exchange necessary information. Um, Mary, do. Do we well, have I someone see, else? I see Catalina, Catalina. unmuted. Catalina. So, Catalina, did you want to jump in? <laughs> Hi, Catalina. Before you guys start, yes, Tanya, what a pleasure again. And I love all these Ottoman talks, and I'm very grateful for, for them and for your research. Um, just listening to you, it shocked me that the, the Roma would be categorized as Dimi when it was convenient for the Islamic power to play such a role to put them in the non-Muslim category. And this is really something I didn't hear about, but it's convenient and it's so convenient for them also to, um, uh, to 
put so much of their uh, stereotyping thinking into policing the Roma, regulating their lives, and going after them. So what I see coming from your research is an issue of perception and then an issue of policy making and, and trying to control these people. Yeah. And um, within the Muslim world, uh, the Ottomans are really recognized for being more tolerant than other powers. That's why you see it here how uh, it's surprising that they are manipulating cat categories, like they're categorizing their Muslim population, the populations in such a way, in the same way that they are very disparaging um, when they talk about the Turks before modernity came by. So that's another category that they, they dis dislike. And those who are not part of the Ottomans before the Tanzimat came, the non-Ottoman Muslim subjects of the empire also was marginalized. So I wonder if there this would be this would enrich your perspective of all these Muslim categories that um, I mean that are artificially constructed by the Ottomans um, when it's convenient for them to play the role of controlling such populations. Uh, when perception becomes policy. This is wonderful that you have this research. It stimulates me also since I'm going to very write, uh, to write very soon about Ottoman ideology and Ottomanism in the 19th century to see how that works. It's extremely complex. There's no black and white. There's so much richness to this. So thank you, Sonia, so much. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I, I love that idea of... I, what is it? A limited incorporation, I think, was a term that I that I'm you know playing with in this. Like, yeah, ours, but not ours. Like, sort of ours, and only ours as far as right. And th those shifts, and they're really hard to document. So I see Carol Silverman here. Those of us that keep digging in, and of course Chelsea. Those of us that keep digging into Roma. There's so many gaps, right? We don't get like a straight through line. Okay, in 1620, they were okay. And then 1720, they were not okay. It's very, very piecemeal. Mm -hmm. Or we're trying to put together a more nuanced picture from these pieces. So um, I'm indebted to you for, you know, anything that you might, you know, suggest to me uh, in looking at that. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Chelsea? So can you have your hand up? Thanks. Um, so yeah, that was a great presentation. I mean, I've seen um, a lot of you know our conversations and then our presentations and just seeing the work uh, continuing to evolve. I mean, and also too, because the panel that you and Carol and I did, um, was that last spring? I'm, I'm losing track of- That's right, that's right. Yeah, yes. but we had some yeah. really good conversations about racialization there. Um, so it's just great. Yeah. And um, like I wrote in the chat, you always give me so much to think about. So I'll try to focus in um, and just uh, so uh, two of my students were here. I see one is still here. Um, and of course, I'm teaching this semester, uh, Global Race and Racism. And really, you know, asking this very big question about the applicability of race and racial frameworks to studying the globe, as you know, you have a lot of scholars who um, continue to iterate that race is uh, something that emerges as a form a formation or a process of Western modernity, but like that's not applicable to places outside of, you know, the West. Um, and you know, a lot of scholars refute that, but there still persist these ideas that, especially in the wake of World War II and, and the end of apartheid and more of the understandings of scientific racism as a falsity, that then like there are no, there's no need to study race or like what exists in other global spaces outside of the West is not really race, it's something else. Um, right. but, you know, so I, you know, this work is, you know, critically important to challenging that, but also to historicizing race. And so I say that to say though, one of my, one of my students presented, who's she, she's here, I'm not gonna make her speak up, but about Poland yesterday and, yeah. um, and, um, because we read um, Bolaji uh, Balogun's latest book about um, race and the color line and looking at Poland. 
And one of my students asked when we we're talking about colonization and empire and race, like how far back are we talking about with empires, right? Are we thinking about mm. more modern forms of um, colonization and empire? How do we think about the Polish Lithuanian empire, for example, right? And the role that it played in colonization versus Poland understanding itself as a post-colonial space, right? as a place that was occupied, including Soviet occupation. So how do we think about these terms? Um, I mean, we can go much more distant with empires. And so I, I think to also then complicate the conversation with the Ottoman Empire and the ways that Albania, for example, sees itself as post-colonial in terms of like post-Ottoman um, spaces. Just um, So I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm like taking notes. I am trying to figure out what I could tweak in my own book revisions but how I don't want to do too much because I'm so close to being done <laughs> I don't want to revise too much but how to tell this more complex story around I guess empire and race and um and uh how I, I guess too like the more holistic conversation um about race which repeatedly shows us that racial logics and racializations are indeed global with varying local manifestations but um like what are the through lines? And especially when categories around whiteness, blackness, otherness, you know, what shapes these and like, um, how do we historicize them? So I don't know, that probably wasn't even a single question. That was just more like praise for the work and how no, no, it is. Really. <laughs> it's, it's so, com it, both complex, but also really we get so many wonderful tools from each other. So thank you for that. And yeah, look, we'll, and congrats that you're wrapping that book up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I okay. Is it? If, do you have more response to that or no? Okay, I'm, I'm open for whatever. Okay. Yeah, whatever like, you throw right. at me. All right, let me go. My no, uh, this is such rich material. I'm just blown away. Thank you so much for this. This is so fun. It's. I wish we could have even listen to more of the music. It's just fantastic. Um. So I guess I just have a lot of questions. I'm still kind of trying to formulate, form, sort of formulate it in my mind, but um, I was thinking about this concept of civilization that you brought up. Um, it's something that I've written a little bit about in the Bulgarian context for the 19th century. Okay. Because um, Bulgarians kind of made fun of it. Like, so on the one hand, I think people internalized it and appropriated like elites and were trying to, you know, mimic in some ways like French clothing and all of and, and, and even like styles of you know eating and consumer culture and other kinds of things but they also were like civilizatia like it became became kind of a joke it was like those guys are kind of wusses you know like <laughs> they <laughs> they're mimicking the west like that's not real that's, you know what I mean? They're not true faithful Bulgarians. They're not. And so there was, um, I guess, embedded in this clear effort to Europeanize and civilize and reject the Orient in Bulgaria, like we find Turkey too, or in the Ottoman Empire and later Turkey. There was also embedded resistances to that, mm -hmm. what is Western in all kinds of, at all kinds of levels. And that was always there in that kind of ambivalence. And part of, in some of my work, what I've kind of argued is that a way of dealing with that ambivalence, especially like after independence and this kind of onslaught of Western styles and culture was to try and create an authenticity, a national authenticity. Mm -hmm. And actually part of that was reaching into more what they didn't necessarily call but what we might see as sort of oriental or like mm -hmm. you know local <laughs> styles i mean including music mm -hmm. which very much you know to me i listen to a lot of their own music it sounds like a lot of bulgarian music to mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. i mean i know there's probably like subtle differences like whatever but so the instruments the instrumentation the sound yeah. because to them they're like this is something that sounds to us like what we know, yeah, cool. <laughs> you know, and so there's a way of creating a kind of a Balkan music that pulls mm -hmm. on, I'm sure, Roman music and other things. Mm -hmm. But um, and so I'm just so thinking about that process. One, I wanted to ask you about kind of how resistances from 
not necessarily within the Roman community, but then this, uh, but the Turks and others right. who are, right. you know, in their relationship with Roma, like how it becomes this, you are you are us, you are not us, yeah. like kind of relationship. Right. Um, but then adding to that is this idea of race and trying to think about periodizing it because I think it's really hard. I think mm. in European history, there's a lot of, we really don't have racial thinking until the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, before that, people could easily like assimilate. You could become French. You could mm -hmm. learn French. You could become French. Mm -hmm. People could assimilate into cultures. Mm -hmm. um, in the Ottoman Empire, I think that you could convert to Islam. Uh -huh. You could be 100% in the millet. You just right. need to convert. Right. But at what point or in what spaces might there be areas where like no you can't mm -hmm. like it really is biological right and I think it's probably an uneven kind of entrance into the way people were thinking yeah but I wonder if like Roma were a separate category of like no I mean okay you can convert but are yeah. you really part of the millet right are you really Muslim are right. you really going to mosque like you know right. like where there could have been barriers along color lines or others, mm -hmm. sociability or whatever, where, you know, we're, th we're starting to think biologically here. Right. You know, right. Um, and so, like, I don't think there's a particular moment in which that happened necessarily. There's probably, like, at any given time, I mean, even in Europe, there's always this nature and nurture debate, like, mm -hmm. in the sense of, like, is this biological mm -hmm. or can people actually, can anyone be civilized? Right. Or are there people that can't because they're just not that way? Like they're just, mm -hmm. it's just not working, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so that like, sorry, I opened up like a no, couple that's of great. huge cans of worms. No, that's great. great. Oh, <laughs> and you kind so of layer onto that, the Oriental divide thing, yeah. just happening right in the edge of Europe. Right. And it, it, it sort of like adds a, even one more element. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think actually, I would say maybe we could think about peri periodicization. Um, I, I think it's clearer from within the Ottoman context. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, per again, I'd love to hear from Caroline about this. But I think it with the Tanzimat or whatever, the auspicious reordering reforms, which brought in so many of the minorities into administrative positions, right? Mm -hmm. And this attempt to, okay, let's recognize in the 19th century, so they'll be less likely to want to break off and form their mm -hmm. nation state, right? That it is during that period or and or in response because this literature and the songs proliferate in the 1870s, 1880s. I think it's pushback, just like mm -hmm. we see pushback stuff happening now right and that was also the way to okay well we'll open the doors but only so far mm -hmm. right and up, up, up. because they don't they don't argue about the racial makeup of armenians right right so that was a convenient target for this ongoing schema building project mm -hmm. to then deploy against Roma who had already been kept on the margins of the Ottoman Empire despite converting to Islam, despite, 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 right? Um, so that might be a useful, that might be a useful thing to, to actually add in this periodization. There's something I think that was really dramatically happening in the late 19th century in the Ottoman center um, and I'd be curious about whether you could see echoes across into South in the Ottoman territories mm -hmm. who were yearning to be free or didn't even know yet that they wanted, wanted yeah, right. yearning to be free. free. Yeah. Right. Right. And the impact on Ottoman thinking once they had these, you know, like groups breaking off, the yeah. national revolts, and then how right. that makes something differently about the different peoples within. Right. Yeah. Left behind in the Ottoman Empire, yeah. so to speak. Or who are on both sides of the border now. Right. You know? yeah. Well, and it's certainly, you know, evidence, again, if we look at musical practices and dance uh, dance folklore practices, they continue to claim. There are yes. people they just got left behind, right? Well, the border moved over them, but they really are ours. So what's interesting, even with the Turkish na nation state, Turkey, is a very deeply entrenched idea of those are still our people. And I hear this mm -hmm. from my wonderful colleagues in... Mm -hmm. 
in Turkey, right? Of course they do this. That came from us, <laughs> yeah, right? This is yeah. fascinating. Um, yeah. And if you allow me just to build yeah. on something, you know, because we it, it started in a very interesting direction, you know, with periodization and so on. And I, I've i taken, you know, multiple copious notes, but one particular question that pops out, you know, in this um, you know, center periphery within a, a specific mm -hmm. time context, uh, there is something interesting that you've pointed out. Um, as the cultural canons, you know, are formed and are, and are you know, started to solidify, um, and as what Mary was pointing out, you know, like ours, not ours, all of a sudden, you know, and correct me if I get it right or wrong, so national folk music at certain point in time begins to be sanitized from its roots, mm -hmm. you know, and proximity to, uh, to, 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 to Romani uh, uh, cultural production because it's considered to be vulgar. Mm -hmm. uh, so from the standpoint of ethnomusicologists, um, you know, here is, can you just elaborate a little bit, like, when, when you say sanitize, you know, what what the, does that look like? Oh, gosh. Okay. Well, first of all, I do not believe there's anything called folk music, period. Anytime you <laughs> label something as folk, okay. that's a that's a legitimacy project. Okay. Right. So um, what, I, what, what I will say is that particular part of the cultural apparatus is attached to the government um, in uh, with, with the new Turkish Republic was to control mm -hmm. musical production as a sign of the nation state. And they could do it. They you know, There was no private, but... privatized radio. No, it was a state radio. Mm -hmm. um, there were privatized recording industries. So there was a great deal of tension and that's a whole nother topic. But um, so one of the... Uh, the state invested quite a bit of money and resources into sending collectors out to write down, to record and write down, and then put those writings in the archives and have that disseminated to pro professional performers at the radio who are trained okay, in how okay. to do, quote, folk music, Bulgaria, right? Very so, similar process. Yes. So you just yeah. basically, uh, you know, if I understood correctly, so you do have designated people from the state, you know, which will go out, they will collect the originals and then filter it through the archives, you know, yes. the Senate or so, yes. I see. Yeah. And then uh, as, because your last two slides, right, you know, and you said, you said spot the difference and right. we were not very able to spot the difference because it was yeah. probably, you know, just about the tempo, you know, I'm not a musician, right. but it's the yeah. same thing. Right. Uh, but it needed to be reappropriated by the state right. in, in essence uh and then uh relabeled as, re as a, a re folk, yeah. uh, authentic folklore authentic, authentic. Right. Yeah. yes okay so i understand yeah. that yeah 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 well thank you you know yeah and you know this is also part of the fact that you couldn't have kurdish songs you couldn't have armenian songs right everything had to uh -huh. be in turkish so some of the material that they collected was actually in, quote, the wrong language and was translated into Turkish and put into the archives in its Turkish form. Absolutely. So that was part of ethno-national creation. Um, very different than Yugoslavia, you know, where mm -hmm. you had the key system and recognition of, well, in limited ways, a different linguistic group, maybe more similar to Bulgaria in that. Yeah. So can I provoke you with last one? Oh, you know, oh just, yeah. Uh, you know, speaking of you know, it, it just inevitably will come, you know. Um, I was just thinking about, you know, the former, you know, territories such as Bulgaria that belong to the Ottoman state, you know. Um, and if you look at uh, the development of culture and so on, so we do have, you know, the very last, you know, big sort of significant period was that of state socialism, right? Wherein the state is controlling high culture, you know, it goes totally different canon. Right. And then, you know, 8990, you know, comes right. and there is this revival, you know, of, of consumption, you know, mm -hmm. of, you know, folklore songs, you know, which are, uh, so it, do we see something similar, you know, like processes that, you know, have, uh, you know, developed in the past or we're seeing something completely different in terms of, because, I mean, all I can think of is, you know, this production of, commercial pop songs, right? You know, some of the, 
uh, people that are you know producing them right. are uh, Roma you know, representative the Roma community and so on and then all of a sudden you know they you know get you know redone I think and you know repopularized you know so is it something that we've seen before uh we're is not it, really oh you mean in in the Turkish context or yeah like yeah. In the, you know like we're we're in the post socialist context you know I was thinking mm -hmm. constantly about you know uh you know singers like Aziz or you know yeah. some other you know people which are you know a cultural it's you know well, phenomenon by themselves you know right and who is from yeah uh, yes right. and, and right. uh and yeah. to me it's you know when you were talking about all this process in Turkish context I'm thinking hmm you know how how's that different you know like yeah. from what I've seen or, well you know, one like of the things that's cross-cutting and again you know Carol can speak to this Carol mm -hmm. Doberman is that these community Roma communities listen to each other across borders uh -huh. and they those that's fascinating in and of itself so like Carol and I have talked about, you know, Bulgarian stuff that's drawing on Turkish stuff. And I'm yeah, talking, you know, I tell her, like, you know, you're doing all this Bulgarian stuff. And now the older musicians are really mad because they have to learn a whole different style of improvising. And it's only their kids that can do it. Right. So the mm, we know so much that happens despite controls, right, mm -hmm. in the face of control. And yeah, I yeah. won't even say, you know, it's not. You know, if we get into resistance, then we're talking opposition. And I'm not, mm -hmm. I, I'm, but I'm saying that there are these continual through lines that existed in when I was in Macedonia. Mm -hmm. um, this is actually how I learned about Turkish Roma music and decided to go to Turkey because mm -hmm. my Roma friends were play, sharing recordings of Dendi Selim and Mustafa Kandarala and mm -hmm. Kibaria. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, whoa, I got to see what's going on over there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they were getting it through the black market, right? The shoeshine guys who would sit mm -hmm. at the bus stops also had their you yeah, know, right? their cassettes. Their cassettes, right? Cassettes, yeah. right? So I think um, the question is, when is it that mainstream industries and or governments appropriates it, right? Yeah. decide that they can't, uh -huh. right? And again, you could look at Carol Silverman's book on this, um, writings about the Bulgarian uh, mm -hmm. wedding, mm -hmm. you know, scene was an example of the government going, okay, let's you know, make money off of it. <laughs> Uh, can't shut it down. Right? Yeah. yeah, better better adopted, right? Yeah, right. like more co-opted. Right. Well, thank you for this. You know, it's just a lot of food for thought. You know, I mean, I think we had, you know, previously had conversations about, you know, the role of pop folk, chalga, and you know how and why is it so um, consistent and you know and vital. Right. Well. So, and uh, when we look at you know this whole context, you know it all makes sense. He's not. He's been, you know, for a very long time. You know, uh, and um, thank you for um, giving us all those wonderful details. I also just like Mary. You know, I'm curious just to hear. You know, like more of the. Uh, you know the recordings that you have. Oh yeah, we should have a big, <laughs> big listening session. Really, yeah. yes. Well, certainly as I'm packing up here, I can you know put, put some put some stuff on. But yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and thank, thank you so much for coming. Thank, thank you yeah. so much. For oh, no, thank and you. That I see that fantastic. we have like a, a lively discussion underneath, which continues. You know, which yeah. I'm. I can only see on the screen, but I'm uh, I'm assuming that um, you know uh, this was due to the interesting presentation. That we oh, and I love this empire to nation state transition. Woo! I'm down. I'm down. I'm a, I'm a big proponent for that. It's been understudied in the Ottoman context, and let's do that if we can organize something. I got the music. I got Rita. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So, thank, thank you, Mr. And yeah. absolutely looking forward to see you again in two weeks. Two weeks.